Welcome, everybody. How you doing? Doug Berry here, here to talk with you again about what's going on in the world. A couple of things to think about, things we should be considering, things we can do to be better prepared. And I'm going to make this very clear. We are seeing things escalate very quickly right now over in Israel. Right before I got on here, I saw a headline. I'm going to pull this up. This is something that I just really want to know if we're really thinking much about. Iran, excuse me, Iran, Iran warns their hands are already on the trigger, which means they're ready to go. Israel worries about possible Iran escalation. We are hearing that we've got a couple of aircraft carriers. One, it looks like it's already there. Another, it looks like it's on the way, the USS Horde and the Eisenhower, the Ford and the Eisenhower, the two aircraft carriers that have been designated to go over there to take care of what's going on right now, to be ready to back what's going on right now. All right, this is a very tense situation. They're saying, as of this morning, 199 hostages. At the time I record this, by the way, if anybody who's going to watch this video later sees this, uh, right now it's uh, 3 in the afternoon and on the 17th, Monday the 17th, they're saying 199 hostages are being held. This is creating uh, it just a, it, it, there's just no way out of this that's easy. There's just no way. The devastation of what Hamas has already shown they're willing to do. Hezbollah has been involved already. Iran's threatening that their fingers are already on the trigger. We know that we've got a lot of players over there in that region of the world, and and not even in that region of the world alone, that will probably and most likely wouldn't have a problem getting involved in this. So what's happening right now, we've got to be thinking about what we need to do. We've got to be thinking about what we can do. We've got to be thinking about what our best step is when it comes to at least us, where we are, what we're capable of. Now, we're all capable, of course, and should be involved in things such as prayer. That should have been going on for a long time. We've only been hearing the prophecies of the Blessed Mother forever. Church-approved prophecies. Fatima, 1917, where on July 13th, she showed the children the vision of hell. She told the children that if man does not stop offending God, there will be a second and much more terrible war that would come. And it happened 21 years or so later. 1938, Hitler, the whole beginning of World War II, the devastation still goes on to this day. What people experienced back then. But it wasn't just then. We've had other warnings from our Blessed Mother as well. In Rwanda, church approved, where she appears to three teenage girls, 1981 to 1989. For one of them, she had Alphonsine through 1989. The other two were a little bit shorter in their apparitions, but she revealed in 1982 to these girls that there would be a genocide. She showed them images. God, through Our Lady, showed images to these three teenage girls of a genocide that would hit Rwanda. This is something that, again, prophesied by Our Lady, but there's more that has been prophesied. And Quapa, Nicaragua, 1980. This is a little-known apparition, by the way. Quapa, Nicaragua, 1980. Our Blessed Mother appeared to a man named Bernardo Martinez, who eventually became a priest, Father Bernardo. He has since passed away. And she made it clear to him, in not, not, not uncertain words, very clear, because of your lack of response to my call for conversion, meaning us in the world, you are hastening the arrival of a third world war. So this is not something to take lightly with what's going on right now. There are people out there who will constantly be the naysayers to say, well, you know, it's saber rattling. You know, it's not saber rattling. Does it lead to World War III? We don't know for sure. I'm never going to say that. I don't know. No one knows for sure. But we know that the prophecies are out there that this is what, what could happen. But what can we do in our little part of the world? I've said this many, many times. We can't go to the Vatican right now and sit in the Senate. No one invited me to the Senate. I can't sit down and talk about what I think should and shouldn't happen. I know the Senate is on synodality. is supposed to be a dialogue. You know, I didn't want to get into that one right now, but the, what's going on in the church and the leadership in the church and the confusion and frustration with everything in the church is just, it, it's off the charts. And so again, I'm not going to get into that right now, but I do want to say this. I want to say that we have the opportunity here right now in our little pocket of the world, wherever we are, to go to God directly through something as simple as prayer. Connect the heart to God. Something as powerful as the rosary. Can't encourage that enough, especially right now, because it's easy to start losing hope. I don't want anybody to lose hope. I want to encourage in these videos people not to lose hope. We're going to talk about the difficult things such as, yeah, the Rwandan genocide. Nearly a million people were killed in approximately three months. Three months. 
the brutality of neighbor killing neighbor was was unheard of. And the genocidal rape, the murdering of, 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 of mothers and babies being cut out of their wombs, it's just, it's unspeakable. Fields of thousands of dead bodies. They would go to the churches. You've seen the documentaries. You will see where they have the bones, the skulls, and, and the other bones of the body kept in a memorial, giving an idea of how many people died and how quick this was unleashed when the president's plane was shot down on April 7th, 1994. But again, 12 years prior to that, 1982, the Blessed Mother, by the power of her son only, showed these three teenagers this apparition of Rwanda that would turn into a genocide. What was the response? What is our response now when we see these very serious threats? It's as if God is showing us it's starting to unfold, but you can mitigate this. You can reduce this. You can you can lessen the chaos with your prayers and your sacrifices. And that's something every single one of us can do wherever we are. We can't go over there right now. I don't know about you. I, I'm not in a position to go over and negotiate between Hamas and, and Israel, which, by the way, the Hamas charter, if you have not heard the Hamas charter, the things that are said in there, there is no room for negotiation when it comes to Israel or the Jewish people. They simply, and, and many of the Arab nations, simply do not Find room for the Jews anywhere in the world, let alone in the Hamas charter. They talk about things such as, well, one of the leaders of Hamas, at least, one of the founding members, the treachery of Christianity that that needs to be done away with. So this isn't over. This is escalating very, very quickly. Our response to it, though, that's something we cannot underestimate. And I know it's hard when you're sitting there and you're watching news, you're going through you know, you know, your social media and you're seeing reports of this and that. And I know some people who just intentionally, and I have to do this too sometimes, just not associate with the news. Get enough information on it. Get enough. Know what's going on, but then don't wallow in it. You know, you sit there and listen to all the speculation from all the different news commentators out there. They bring in this expert and that expert, and they say, well, we think that if this happens, then this could happen. Well, this might happen if this happens, because based on this and what happened in 1967 or 1948 with Israel and so forth, we think that this could happen. There's a lot of speculation. Okay, you want to listen to some of that. All right, but I don't know how much good it really does, at least for me. I want to know facts. I want to know what's going on, and I'm going to be praying like crazy, making visits to the Blessed Sacrament and adoration. Even if it's 10, 15 minutes, middle of the day, you're driving out, you're running errands, you're going to the store, stop in the chapel, go to the church, just kneel before Jesus in the tabernacle and just pray. All of this, all the warnings of chastisements and all the chastisements that the world has ever been dealt, anything that has ever been allowed or caused by God, we're talking about things such as the flood, the burning of Sodom and Gomorrah to World War II. In fact, the Blessed Mother made clear to the children in Fatima that God allows war because of man's sin. That was a statement little Saint Jacinta made clear, that the Blessed Mother had made clear to the children that God allows war because of man's sin. So the answer then, if we want to reduce the risk of war, we want to avert war, we want to minimize the chaos and damage of war is conversion. It's, it's not a complicated thing. It really isn't when you look at the big picture. The problem is many people simply don't have the faith for it. I've struggled with it. I'm sure many of you have as well. The faith to really understand that my, my process of conversion can actually help a global conflict get better somehow. There's mystery to this that we're never going to fully comprehend. And I think we all know that. But we also know that God does not put us on an island and expect us just to function on our own out there. We are part of this world. We're part of society. We're part of the body of Christ, the mystical body of Christ. We make up humanity, and we all play a part in that. As St. Paul would say very clearly, we are all different members of the same body. The toe, the finger, the ear, the eye, the nose, they all have different parts. or They play different roles, I should say. So what we need to be doing right now, I believe, and I want to encourage you in this, in this video, Really look seriously at what steps we can be taking right now, both spiritually and naturally. Spiritually and naturally, when it comes to being better prepared. Right now, we're hearing all kinds of reports, if you're paying attention, that in Gaza, they're out of power, they're running out of, out of food, they're, they're having problems with fuel, uh, they're trying to get people out before the ground troops come in from Israel. 
there's all these different pieces that we're hearing boil down to something that I really want to address. And that is the fact that when we have serious crisis in this world, there are far too many people. And I have seen this in comments on previous videos I've been doing from last week about this conflict. And we talk about our, our BREP course, our Be Ready Emergency Preparedness course that's on sale right now. I have seen so many comments from people who say, we're just going to trust Jesus, Doug. We're just going to, no, I've been hearing that for years. What St. Padre Pio says, right? Pray, hope, and don't worry. That doesn't mean don't prepare, though. If you're driving down the road and you got to get to, to mass and you look at the, at the gas tank and you see that it's almost on empty and you realize you've got a ways to go to get to mass and you're probably not going to make it with what you've got in the gas tank, just pray, hope, and don't worry. And don't stop for gas. Of course. You know what I'm saying. That doesn't make any sense. Pray, hope, and don't worry, but take care of those things that are logical and obvious things that God wants us to take care of. Your child falls and, and breaks their leg, falls off out of a tree, falls off a ladder, falls off the playground, hurts their arm. They need help. You don't just go to your child and say, we're going to pray, we're going to hope, and we're not going to worry. Get back up and keep playing. They got a broken leg or broken arm. You take them to the doctor. You take them to the hospital, the emergency room. So when it comes to something like the potential, uh, what we're seeing here of with this war escalating, just like we should be prepared when a hurricane is going to hit, uh, recently one that hit Florida. What did people in Florida do? I got some good friends down there, and I know what they did. They got ready. Some did, not all did, but some did, and they evacuated. They 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 got extra materials. They got together in community. They they made sure they were there to support each other. These are the things that we do when we see an obvious problem. We address them and we get involved in taking the steps that are necessary to do that. Right now, there's a real tentative attitude. I think people have the tentative attitude is where well, we see that this war could escalate, and we see how quickly it is escalating. The fact that we've got again the Eisenhower and Ford, both aircraft carriers in the region or, or on the way, the Eisenhower's on the way, last I heard. And I'm just looking at news reports. I'm watching videos that are scrolling up and concerns over the risk of the war spreading in the Middle East. And Iran is now saying that their finger is on the trigger and Hamas wants Palestinian civilians to be killed. Former Israeli ambassador to the U.S. warns and the U.S. is standing firm. And then you've got other Arab nations out there that are saying, hey, easy, we don't want this to escalate. But then they're, they're who they siding with. And then there's always Russia in the background. And then, of course, you've got China and Taiwan, and it can be overwhelming. But these are all part of the prophecies that we've been hearing. And again, let's address briefly that there are many people out there who have heard that October was supposed to be a key month that would potentially be the beginnings of more trials and greater tribulations to come, potentially a World War III, possibly in future months. Who knows? But we do know that things are happening in October. October 7th is when the attack against the Holy Land in Israel began. And that's the feast of the Battle of Lepanto from 1571. It's also the feast of Our Lady of the Most Holy Rosary and the feast of Our Lady of Victory. I don't know if that's coincidental. I don't know. And some would say, oh, so do you think Hamas decided to pick that day? I don't know. I doubt it. Maybe. Maybe because there was a great Muslim battle that was lost on, in, on, in 1571 on October 7th. Or maybe the enemy, the spiritual enemy, is using anybody that will cooperate as a puppet. And that's where we're getting this kind of poke in the gut or this slap in the face. Bottom line is, it happened. And it happened in October. And there were prophecies saying October would be a key month. Now, we're halfway through October. It's the 17th right now. Already enough has happened that really makes you wonder if those prophecies weren't accurate. I'm not saying with any certainty they were or they were not, but I will say this. The potential of just the obvious in-your-face signs of the times that we're seeing should be enough for us to sit down, hunker down, make sure we're getting that prayer in like we have been told over and over by the Blessed Mother and many saints and mystics over the years was, is, is, not was, is critical for averting war and bringing peace to the world. In fact, those are the words of the Blessed Mother in Fatima to the children in all six apparitions. It's pretty much the only thing that she repeated each time. When you pray the rosary, you can avert war and bring peace to the world. So with that in mind, I guess my question for all of us is, are we deepening the prayer? That's got to be that constant encouragement. And I encourage you all, keep going. Do not get discouraged. No matter how much we see 
the chaos in the world, the craziness in the church and the synod, all the sadness in this world, persevere. Persevere. Now, this is one of those things where you can talk to anybody who's been in military conflict, you know, soldiers, and they'll tell you it's a long, drawn-out situation. Think of the World War II guys, for example, who were fighting in the South Pacific, island to island. Islands like Okinawa, where they were told, some of these islands like Okinawa was one, where they were told, you know, we're going to take this island in three days or 10 days, and they're on the island for a month or two months, whatever the numbers are, and they have to dig deep inside and persevere so as not to lose their wits, lose their mind, lose lose their, their, their spirit. It's going to be the same, already is for some, it's going to be that way for a lot more of us as these things unfold, I believe. Persevere. Dig deep. Don't let your, your spirit be crushed by the things that are happening in this world. Yes, we've got to pray. That's an enormous piece of this, but God gives us physical natural pieces of the puzzle as well. That's why having, having laughter in your life, you know, having good friends and people you can communicate with, talk with, people who understand your humanity and love you regardless, that unconditional love that we all crave and that we should give, these are also very important pieces of giving us hope so that we don't lose our, our sanity, lose that spirit of, of just wanting to you know, there are people who just want to, they don't want to just exist in life. They want to live. But when you see these things, when you hear these things happening in the world, it's easy to just feel the pressure and just exist. And as things get heavier and harder, and what I've got here on the other monitor is a video clip playing of news reports, and it's showing, it's showing the, just the devastation of blown up buildings, of uh, just, just rubble everywhere. If that comes to, our neighborhood, just as it is right now in places like Israel, Gaza, Ukraine, anywhere in the world where you see this kind of war, the individual human spirit in a situation like that struggles like crazy. So number one, we got to pray for them. But number two, we got to be thinking about what we can do on a natural level. Again, hope comes from a plan of action in the face of a crisis. You realize that even chocolate in World War II, when chocolate was given to the soldiers that helped them get through the day. Plus, had a little, little shot in the arm of some good solid chocolate was, wasn't bad for the body. Then they would share it with children sometimes in war-torn areas of Europe or wherever they were. And sharing that little bit of chocolate with those children gave those children hope. So it's little things like that. It's a human thing. It's a tangible thing. It was, it was a food or candy, whatever you want to call it, gave hope. That's what we're talking about right now. How do we bring hope? How do we have such preparation to bring hope? Look, we need to ask the question how long we're going to have to endure what's going on. And we don't know for sure. There's no, no way to know for sure. But it does give us a good, a good starting point to consider what we're doing because many people don't have food or water to last even for a few days. If you check your food pantry right now, how much food do you have? How long would it last if the, if the grocery stores were shut down right now? And I would say this, for those of us in the United States, and I'm in Texas, as I am recording this right now and doing this video, but those of us in the U.S., we all, I think, for the most part, feel like that sort of thing can never happen here. What happened in Israel, for example, or what's going on in Gaza, what's going on in Ukraine, what's going on in places like that in the world where bombs are flying in or terrorists come across the border. Israel was hit with approximately 1,500 Hamas members who came in from different angles, different positions. And major failure with regards to intelligence on this one. No question about that. But we don't think that would ever happen here in the States. And yet we've had the border wide open. We have drug cartel activity. We have, we have um, uh, Islamic and, and Muslim training camps over here. That's all been revealed by the FBI years ago even. Over 10 years ago, there were reports of that. We've seen the border, let's emphasize that again, wide open for several years now. We have no idea how many people it got through. We know of the ones, some of the ones that are caught, where some of them are coming from. The potential of problems arising in the United States is very real. And we can't always just think, well, you know, someone's going to come and save us. National Guard's going to show up. FEMA's going to show up. They'll call out local church groups. They'll come out there ready to go. Knights of Columbus will be there. They will to some degree. But if this becomes a problem that is far bigger than what they can all handle working together, then it will be on 
you and me and what we have done in advance to prepare for whatever crisis might unfold. Now, I think it's much more realistic to consider now with what happened in Israel last week that something like that could happen here, especially when Iran is saying that their finger's on the trigger. I mean, their finger's on the trigger is what they're saying. Go back to that quote there. Iran warns their hands, their hands are already on the trigger. What if they initiate things in the United States or more in the UK? You know, we've got a lot of things like no-go zones where it's just neighborhoods law enforcement doesn't even want to go into, especially over in Europe. There's a few of those places here in the United States too. They're kind of sticky situations. What if something escalates from there? This is not fear-mongering either. Look at the news. Look at how things are unfolding. And then ask the question, are we going to turn a blind eye to the potential even? So let's take the right steps to make sure that we're doing the basics. I've talked about this many times. Our BREP course, Be Ready Emergency Preparedness course, it's on sale right now. Check it out, brcoalition.com. Also goes into great detail about these things. If you don't buy the course, that's up to you. It's on sale for the next several days, at least four or five, four more days, I believe, to the end of the week. If you don't buy the course, that's entirely up to you. Get some things done anyway. All right. People sometimes have accused me in the comment section. Well, he's just trying to sell this course. Look, I know if the people in my neighborhood aren't prepared, and I am, they're going to come to my door. I want them prepared. Don't you want your friends and your families prepared? Don't you want them to take the steps to have some food, some water, some shelter, some medical care? And I don't mean just bandages and, and, and uh, you know, hydrogen peroxide that pour in a wound. I'm talking about having things like a tourniquet and pressure bandages and knowing how to deal with certain things. Stitching up a wound could be a laceration to a gunshot, to a knife. We don't even know. It could be chopping wood and get hurt because you're trying to you're trying to get fuel for a fire because you're living in a colder climate and the gas gets shut off or there's problems with electricity, the power stations are going down. This sort of stuff is going on right this moment in places like Gaza, areas of Israel, where they've had power outages, where there's food supply problems, where there's power problems. This happens in hurricane storms. I just don't know how many times we can see things around us that should motivate us to be thinking about what we have in our back pocket or in our closet, in our cupboard, to help even a little bit in a crisis. I use the example a lot. I always carry this on me everywhere I go. Tactical flashlight. Tactical, doesn't matter. Call it a flashlight. It is more of a tactical one because it's built a certain way. 1,500 lumens. It's about a $65 flashlight from Olight. I like Olight. I like Streamlight as well. And by the way, our, our Be Ready Emergency Preparedness course goes through all of this stuff in great detail with links to these things as well. BRCoalition.com if you're interested in that. But let's address the fact that if the lights go out, this is always on me. So I can pop this on and I've got up to 1,500 lumens. Now it's got four different settings. It's also got, actually five. It's got this one. This is a great one. I hold it down long enough. This little guy right here, that's called moon mode. It's half a lumen. So you got to go into your kid's room at night. And in my case, I might have to go check on my grandkids when they're spending the night. And I can go in with moon mode and it doesn't brighten things up too much. My point here is that I brighten that up a little bit. There we go. Okay. My point is having something as simple as a flashlight, having something as simple as a battery, uh, a battery charger here, having something as simple as pepper spray on hand, having something critically essential as water filters that will filter out water from ponds, lakes, streams. It will filter and purify the water and make it drinkable. If you do not buy our course, so be it. Get some of these things though. Figure out your drinking water. Figure it out. If you don't have any extra water in your house right now and your water gets shut off, you nothing coming out of the faucet because the community water system is down, where's your water coming from? I've seen it here in East Texas. Snowmageddon was something that happened a few years ago and other times too. Well, recently, the, the town of Tyler, which I'm near, um, had a water contamination problem. And for about three or four days, they were told in the news, don't drink the water, it's contaminated. E. coli or something got in there. I'm not sure what it was for sure. I'm, I'm not on that water system, but I heard it because I go into town a lot and the grocery stores, their cases of water, gallons of water were selling out like that. But what if it's a long-term one? How long are we going to have to endure? We don't know. 
So that's why having something like a water, good water purifier, filter purifier, and a source of water like a lake, a pond, a natural spring, knowing where those things are in advance are key pieces of being able to survive the problem. Because we don't know. You know, where I am, I'm not too far from a massive lake, massive lake. And these water purifier filters will make that water drinkable. Okay, Lifesaver is a great brand. And they've got several different versions that are out there. Sawyer is a good one. Life Straw is a good one. These are things we have in our course. Again, brcoalition.com if you're interested. But what I'm saying is you've got to get these pieces in place. I know some of you probably have watched my videos over and over. And I know there's some of you out there. God bless you. I appreciate you coming back and watching the videos. But I know some of you are watching the videos and you probably still haven't pulled the trigger, so to speak, on some of these things. I really got to encourage you, whether it's something like backup light, backup power. Here's a great one. I got this. I wanted to show you all this one. This is a little mini Blue Eddy. It's a 300 watt unit, 10 pounds. This thing is 10 pounds, okay? So I can throw this in the back of the car and bug out with it and I've got extra power with me. It's a solar powered, solar panel powered unit. I can charge it up to the wall. I can charge it up with a 12 volt off my vehicle, but I can charge it up with solar panels. So wherever I go, I can have access to power. Getting something like this is really important to have. I know people have generators, gas powered generators. I have my opinion on gas powered generators. I'm concerned about them because they make noise. Bad guys know you have them. And in a crisis situation, say, for example, like what's going on in the Middle East, there are going to be people out there, if law enforcement is stretched thin and they hear you've got a generator because they can hear it because you've got to have it outside because you've got to vent it outside so carbon monoxide doesn't in the house kill you. So you've got to have it outside. They hear you have it. They want your generator. They hear you have it. They know you have fuel to run the generator. And if you've got fuel in a generator, you're probably the type of person that has other things as well, like water, food, maybe in firearms, ammunition, medical supplies, things that people are going to need and good people can become desperate very quickly when things become desperate, when times become desperate. This is not fear. This is practical, reasonable thinking. This is taking the steps in advance to have things ready. Now, your, your battery station, you can get the larger ones that'll actually run your refrigerators, that will run your deep freeze so you don't have all your food go to waste if you have power outages for several days you know, beyond what your refrigerator and freezer are going to handle. You know, they might be really well insulated, but there's going to come a point in time if they're not on, they're not running, where they could easily run out of that cold and your food could be lost. So having backup power to handle those things and not draw too much attention to yourself is a good idea. So battery stations are good. We go through all this in the course. Um, again, things like flashlights, uh, pepper spray. I got water filters here. Even something as simple as, and a lot of people might not be thinking about this, getting a hatchet, an axe, things like that, just in case power is out, gas might be hard to get, and you might not have access to your chainsaw. You might not have access to, to uh, tools and things that you need to cut, to survive and such. So even getting sharpening stones. Sharpening stones for your hatchet and your axe and your knives, okay? Hunting knives, work knives, utility knives. All right? These are things to think about. Again, 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 and again, and again, we cover it in the course, but if you don't get the course, and it's on sale now, but if you don't get it, get some of these things. Go to our BR Coalition YouTube channel. We have several videos on there, free content, gives you ideas on water storage, on power, backup power, on basic things that are helpful and can be actually life-saving things, like the water filter purifiers. So go out to BR Coalition YouTube channel, check out the free content there, or go to, here. there's more on my Doug Berry channel. Yeah, I talked last time in the last video and I wanted to show this. This is an example of a, just a simple backpack that can easily be turned into an emergency bag or a go bag. In this, this is the one I travel with when I fly, when I go to conferences and events and parish missions and such, and I, I travel with certain things you can't take on an airplane, obviously, like firearms, hunting knives, survival hatchets, you know, things like that. They frown on that, that's not gonna get through. So I don't take those, obviously, unless I would put them in the belly of the plane by checking them in a bag, which I, I rarely do that. But this has a water filter in it. It's got a small med kit. It's got you know basic things, even a bandana, which I can use to purify, filter, not purify, filter out large sediment in water before I run it through the filter that I do have in here. 
makes it better on the filter. You don't clog up the filter as fast and so forth and so forth. Uh, protein bars in here, uh, a rain poncho, basic things like this. Now, these are things we encourage you to be looking at. Now, I'm going to say this again. We say it in the course. We teach it in the course, the BR Coalition, the Be Ready Coalition, uh, Be Ready Emergency Preparedness course at brcoalition.com. It will help you get started the right way. We also have a free, emphasize free video on my Doug Berry YouTube channel, right here, this channel, that has a two-part video that goes into the details of building an emergency bag. The reason I'm saying this again is because I want as many of you as possible to be as prepared as possible spiritually and naturally. Now, I'm not able to keep up with the comment section over here. A lot of comments coming in, and I really appreciate this. But I really want to emphasize something. A lot of the comments that I see later when I go out and look at comments on videos, there's still, God bless, a lot of the people out there that are faithful and prayerful and still have the attitude, well, I'm not too worried about this stuff, Doug, because God is going to take care of these things for me. And I want to emphasize something, and I noticed, Valerie, you just made mention of it here. I have reminded many, many times the story in the Old Testament of Joseph. When Joseph is in prison and Pharaoh has a terrible dream, scares him to death about the seven skinny cows, seven fat cows, seven skinny cows eat the seven fat cows, but the seven skinny cows say skinny. There's seven skinny grain, seven fat grain, the grain eats the fat grain, and the skinny grain stays skinny. There's something going on here. He doesn't know what it means. Joseph is called out of prison. Joseph listens to the story and says, that dream is something from God telling you, by the way, Pharaoh is a pagan, godless man. And God works through him in connection with Joseph to have this dream revealed and the understanding of the dream to be known. And Joseph says, we're going to have in the land of Egypt seven bountiful years. They're going to be great. Yeah. And then we're going to have seven years of famine. Natural disaster. Seven years of famine. Type of famine that can kill people from starvation. And Pharaoh says to Joseph in so many words, well, what do we do? And Joseph's response clearly is, get ready for it. That's called preparation. So what happens? Pharaoh puts Joseph in charge, makes Joseph second to Pharaoh only in the land of Egypt, gives him one of his daughters as a wife, basically says, you're in charge, buddy. Make this happen. For seven years, Joseph is going all over the land of Egypt, and they are building a system, an infrastructure, and they're storing up food. You don't just take food and sit it in a room. you got to build bins, storage bins, because they have to have enough food to last for seven years for an entire nation. And as Scripture states, all the world came to Egypt at that point. It wasn't just Egypt. It was all the provinces around. It's the region where the war is going on right now. And what happens? They all come to Egypt, and by the grace of God working through this really bizarre relationship of Pharaoh, a godless man, a pagan, and Joseph, a very holy man, a faithful man, and working through this scenario, lives are saved because people have food to eat. There's so much in that story that says to us, not only is there spiritual trust that we have to have in God, but we have to have that physical component. We have to be involved in the pieces of the puzzle that require us to do our part. And so I think it's one of the greatest scriptural examples of preparation, not to mention the flood and Noah and all the time that was spent building an ark, getting it ready. You know how many people would have been laughing in both these cases, laughing at Noah for building that ark. You're nothing but a fruitcake, man. What are you doing building this big ark? Flood? What are you talking about? They had no concept what was coming. No, we can look back hindsight 2020. We tell stories to our kids about the flood and the animals two by two walking onto the ark. It's a cute little kid story. It's about a disaster. It's, a, it's about a chastisement that destroyed the world. Funny how we turn it into a kid's story, isn't it? We don't necessarily tell them the rest of it, that everybody drowned. I'm sure there were major conversions as the water is rising over day after day. People are repenting, I'm sure. You would think, but the point is, Noah would have been laughed at, mocked, ridiculed because he was doing what God said, prepare. What do you think happened with Joseph and Pharaoh? You know the small talk you know, around the water cooler back in Egypt at the time would have been, yeah, so I guess Pharaoh had this dream in this guy, Joseph, who was in prison, yeah, for some potential like, sexual harassment thing, yeah, that's what he was in prison for, and he gets pulled out, and this guy interprets 
Pharaoh's dreaming now. This guy, a prisoner, an ex-con, sexual harassment charges, is made second in charge? And we all got to start pitching in and throwing in some food and all the other pieces of the puzzle that would have created the infrastructure for that survival. They would have thought this was lunacy. But God worked through that. So here we are sitting here today, and there, I could go through dozens and dozens of, of, of different stories and scenarios from small personal ones to larger ones, scriptural and natural. When I say scriptural, I should say secular as well, like wars and genocides and such that constantly point to the same thing, the need for us to take the steps to be better prepared. We will always fare better. And it, maybe it's not for us. Maybe all the stuff that I've prepared, maybe maybe all that I'm doing is for someone else. Maybe it's for my kids or grandkids or, or neighbors or somebody else. Maybe God is just calling me to do this now. There are people out there that are building refuges, underground refuges right now. I know this because I was in one. I went in one in Pennsylvania probably 15, 20 years ago, maybe, 20, eh, give or take 20 years maybe. And I walked in this, this man who is now deceased was building an underground refuge. And I kid you not, it was the size of a small gymnasium. It was built to be submerged underwater in Pennsylvania. And it was built with, I am not exaggerating, two foot thick concrete walls reinforced with steel. I walked in it. It wasn't completed, but I walked in it. It still had construction lights hanging down and it was in the process and it was built into the side of a hill on a farm in Pennsylvania. And he told me directly he knows of at least three others that have been built already in America. This was 20 years or so ago. I said, why are you building? He says, I don't know. But God made it abundantly clear that I needed to do this. I said, are you going to be here to use this? He says, I don't even know. He says, I might just build it and someone else uses it. Well, he has since passed away. So we don't understand necessarily the way God works. But we really got to look at those scripture accounts, for example. I'm just really honestly, look at human nature in the midst of the Pharaoh, Joseph, seven years of preparation, especially at a time when they had seven years of great interest rates, we'll call it. You know what it's like when things look really good and people are sure this is never going to go away. Things are great. This is not going to change. They had seven years of bounty. Nothing's good. What do you think? A famine coming? Ah, that's just a bunch of fear mongering conspiracy theory and then seven years of famine hit and the famous line from the old testament is ite ad yosef which means go to joseph joseph was the one that was in charge of dispensing even to people from all over the provinces even outside of egypt and all over egypt but look at those two accounts just those two alone Look at the account of, of Noah and the flood and the preparation of the ark and how people would have looked at him and thought he was crazy for preparing for something that made no sense could ever come. And then look also at the situation of Joseph in the Old Testament and the seven years of famine, seven years of bounty. And again, human nature involved in all these pieces. And then look at World War II when these three little children in Fatima said, there's going to be a second war if man doesn't stop offending God. Oh, that's never going to happen. World War I was not, not even over yet. It ended in 1918. No one's ever going to do this again. This is too violent. It's too bloody. You're, you're talking crazy, kids. You're just 7, 9, and 10 years old. You don't know what you're saying. You know that had to be said somewhere as people were hearing this. And then how many years went by when people are thinking, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Uh -huh, yeah, we'll see. And then the war broke out. And people to this day still, many people don't even know that World War II was a prophesied chastisement by the mother of God. But again, human nature at the time, they would have thought it was crazy to prepare in any way. And yet some people had an idea and an inkling. And when Hitler started behaving the way he did before the war broke out, there are many people that got out of Germany because they sensed it. They knew something wasn't right. They prepared and then they moved where they needed to. They relocated. That's one of the categories we talk about in our emergency preparedness course about shelter is when your home gets compromised for whatever reason, the region of your country, or it's compromised by a storm, or a chemical spill on a train, whatever it is, then you have to go somewhere else. Are you thinking about other locations you could go to? Be doing that right now. Right now, be doing that, thinking, where else could I go? Who could I work with? What community can I build with other people so that we can all make sure we get through this together? Again, this is stuff we go through in the course. But if you don't get the course, I will say this again and again, be thinking it right now. Be th I, would, I would do a video on this Anyway, even if I didn't have a course to offer you at 50% off, 
at brcoalition.com. If you're wondering where it is, brcoalition.com. But I would be talking this way anyway because I was talking this way for years before we even started BRC. We started BRC just over three years ago. I've been talking about these things uh, for 40 years. The Marian apparitions, prophecies, Fatima in particular. And then eventually as the years went by and I learned more about Akita, about Quapa, Nicaragua, where she prophesied a third world war. I've been talking about the need to be ready for these things, about the need to pray and fast. And in the last 15 years, when I started doing what was called battle ready rallies, I was saying, look, things are showing themselves to be kind of crazy. You need to be ready to deal with things. You need to be battle ready. And that involves physical as well. Another thing we address in the course is defense. Look what happened in Israel. Look at the, some of the stories where they came into homes. I just recently, over the weekend, read an article, a very sad article. It's about a man named Zaka. I know the group is called Zaka. Forgive me. Zaka is the group's name. I got that wrong. I did that earlier too. Zaka, Z-A-K-K-A, -K -K -A, I believe is the way you spell this. This is a group that is made up of, of Jewish people in particular, I believe, maybe others are helping, and they go to a, locations and events where there's been a terrorist attack of some sort, and they collect the body. Bodies, pieces of the body. They want to give it a respectful burial, and they want every piece of the body that died of their Jewish people. After this happened in Israel last Saturday, he said he has never in his 30, I think three years of doing this work, never seen some of the brutality that he saw here. He said the dance festival where about 280 people died, a lot of young people out there dancing, you know, trees and people spread around, like a small mini Woodstock, I suppose. And when Hamas showed up, they just opened up gunfire and started shooting people. People were running, they were hiding in cars, they'd hide in the dumpsters, garbage cans, they'd hide in bathrooms like porta potties, and they just either mowed them down or tossed a grenade in there and just blew them up. And then he said, when they went to the kibbutzes, which is like the neighborhoods and the homes, this was different because they went through the homes and they found families that had been tortured, piles of like 10 or so bodies of children that had had their hands tied behind their backs and they were tortured to death. And he went on details. There were beheadings, decapitations, right? There were burned bodies. He said it was just, he said psychologically, emotionally, his whole team is suffering seriously from, from this sort of thing. It's just, it was too much. But he said he'd never seen this kind of evil, this level of it. Now, Israel's not a third world nation. There are people here in America, just where I am, they just can't fathom that sort of thing, whatever happened here, where 20 different locations, I believe, were hit at roughly the same time in this attack in Israel. And this is the sort of thing that ended up taking place. Now, some people were fighting like crazy. Some people killed some of the terrorists, and they ended up dying, and there are many, many stories out there. I won't get into the details of the stories. I'm sure some of you are familiar with them. But what I am saying is, are you thinking that if that comes to your neighborhood, your life ever, are you ready at all? Now, there's a lot that goes into that, being ready for something like that. What do I mean by that? There's a lot. Thought process about taking someone else's life. Thought process about, being def about, about having a defensive posture and mindset even. It's like knowing how to stand in a conflict. If you got to have a stance where your feet and your hands are, if you're face to face with somebody on a sidewalk or in an alley or someone breaks into your house and comes at you, do you even know how to stand to be able to protect and defend, keeping your arms in a posture to protect your head, your vitals, and not just hands down or, you know, down here like Rocky did in the first Rocky movie, constantly getting punched in the face because his hands were down too low. What I'm trying to say is having an understanding of a defensive posture, understanding what it means to be able to defend yourself, be able to defend and protect your family, your loved ones, those that God has entrusted to your care. This is something that cannot be taken lightly. So, yes, we address that stuff in the course. We also address some of that stuff on our BR Coalition YouTube channel to give you a starting point, a starting point to start getting better prepared. I just had a great conversation with a good friend of mine. He's been military over 30 years, one of my best friends. And we talked about some of these things. We've talked about this stuff before. He's taught me a lot over the years, and I, I have tremendous respect for him. 
And we talked about some of this about the even processing in your mind, the idea of inflicting force on another person in a crisis situation. Some people haven't even thought about that. They just defer to picking up the phone, call 911, someone's going to come and save the day. And I, I will say this again and again, I've talked to many law enforcement around the country and I've had several tell me, you know what, when we show up and one put it in these very succinct words, when you call the police, he's a retired Long Island detective down in Florida, 10, 12 years ago, told me this. He said, 95% of the time when we get there, we're there for two reasons. We clean up the mess and we take the report. You have to be ready, he said. You have to be your first line of defense. You have to be the one that has a plan and an idea of what you're going to do. Even if it's just having pepper spray in a few places of your home that you can get to and, and spray somebody hard in the face, then kick them hard. Hit them with a fire extinguisher. If you go with a firearm, you got to know what you're doing with a firearm then. But the point is, we have to take it upon ourselves. We've become so lazy in this country and in parts of the world, so comfortable, and we like it. I do too. I've got to do things every day. I'll do another video on this. I'm going to wrap this one up here in just a minute. We've, I got to do things every day to harden the target, to harden myself in a way that says I got to keep an edge so that I don't get too soft. One of my favorite quotes that really makes the point is this. And I'll, I'll start wrapping up the video on this. It's from an old Genghis Khan movie where John Wayne plays Genghis Khan. And in the scene, the Mongolians are about to overrun some village. And the night before, the elders of the village come out to negotiate. And somewhere in there, someone says, well, bring your men in and we'll give them food and, 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 and song and, and the whole wine women song thing, right? We'll give them comfort, basically. And someone in Genghis Khan's entourage says, no, the men will stay out here. They'll sleep on the ground. They'll be out here where it's hard, where it's rugged. Because if they go in there into town and they get this, all the comforts, if they become too comfortable, they will get soft. If they get soft, they will get weak. If they get weak, they won't be able to fight. And if they can't fight, they will die. And we can apply that spiritually or naturally. So I encourage you, go out to BRCoalition.com. Check out the course. It's on sale for the rest of the week here. If you don't do that, at the very least, go to our free content on BR Coalition YouTube channel and my YouTube channel right here with Building a Bug Out Bag. Start doing things to make yourself healthier and stronger. Work out, exercise, train, learn how to protect and defend. Take the steps now. We are way late in the game already. See what's happening throughout the world and realize that could happen anywhere, anytime in this world. We are way late on this. For many people, they're way late on it. There are a lot of people out there who've been living this in their training, and I know that this affirms you and confirms because people have told me this in the comment section. Oh, thanks, Doug, for saying this because I've been doing this and people think I'm crazy, but you know, it's good to hear somebody else encouraging it. Well, it just makes sense, whether it's a home invasion, which happens in America on average every 30 seconds, or a woman who's assaulted in America on average every two minutes, why in the world are we training people and helping people be prepared for that stuff? When we see natural disasters and we see things like the water plant that went down for a few days out here where I am near me because of some bacteria in the water and people had to run to the grocery store and panic a little bit and they couldn't even brush their teeth with the water coming out of the faucet, okay? So we have to be realizing that there are always signs around us, signs of the times that say, yeah, this is a good thing to do to be ready, better prepared, body, mind, soul, food, water, shelter, medical defense, build community, understand how to read a map and not just rely everything on GPS on my phone, know how to actually read a map and then have the map with you, which I have one in my backpack here. I travel with wherever I go. I always keep with me. Let's see if I can grab this right here. Yeah, right here. I keep an atlas with me, road atlas. I keep one in my vehicle, one in my backpack. I don't go anywhere without one because if GPS goes down, I still need to know how to get somewhere, especially from traveling cross country. So take the steps not to become so soft, so comfortable, you know, get weak, get weak, can't fight, can't fight, die. Keep yourself sharp. Keep the prayer life up first and foremost. Absolutely. It's not about fear, though. This natural stuff is reality check because we live in a natural world. God put us here and there are people counting on us. All right. BRCoalition.com. BRCoalition.com. Course is on sale for a few more days here. Go check it out. 14-day money-back guarantee on it. It's a, it's a good deal, and it will definitely help you no matter what. All right? 
Okay, I'll be back with you probably tomorrow. Uh, things are changing pretty quick. I'm looking at news reports over here. You know, is uh, Iran says their their hands on the trigger. I mean, Eisenhower's on its way over now. Just keep your guard up, everybody. Things can happen no matter where we are in this world. Things can happen, and they can happen quick. It's not about fear. It's not about anxiety. It's a sense of urgency, but it's a calm urgency that's prepared. It's like a firefighter or law enforcement or military. They get called up on a mission. They get called up on a call. They got to go do something. They're moving urgently, right? But they're not anxious because they're trained. They're trained. Doctors called to ER. We got someone who's got a serious heart attack. They come in. They're not anxious. Oh, no, what do I do to help this person? Hopefully they're not. If they're well-trained as a physician, they're urgent, but they're doing it in a way that is effective because they know what to do because they've taken the steps to prepare for it. That's what I'm talking about here. All right. Okay. God bless and strengthen you all. Don't forget brcoalition.com. Go check it out and take a look at that course. Pray about it. Look it over and uh, check out our free content on BR Coalition YouTube channel and my Doug Berry YouTube channel. And I'll see you real soon in the next video. Take care.